venir à présenter son point de vue justement sur cette question de la création musicale et du religieux. Merci très bien, c'est un grand plaisir d'être ici. Merci de m'avoir invité. Je vais parler en, en, en anglais, ça va mieux si je parle en anglais, mais vous pouvez poser votre question après. Uh, en français, si vous voulez. Um, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be here uh, giving the opening talk this morning in a conference on globalization which foregrounds the question of creativity and with it questions surrounding the aesthetic I think this is very important. Globalization, according to still predominant habits of thought, is a matter of economics rather than society, culture, and human agency. This, as anthropologist Anna Singh pointed out a few years ago, is a very damaging habit of thought. Globalization might equally be thought of in terms of the situated, um, um, the situated um, uh, making, the situated fashioning um, of worlds um, on a, a global scale. And to focus on creativity, or rather to talk about globalization with a focus on creativity, is to reinsert human social and cultural agencies um, into the discussion in important and significant ways. It's also, of course, important uh, to have a clear conception of the place of religion, of the place of the religious in discussions of globalization. Or to put that another way, um, the major uh, monotheistic world religions, uh, particularly Christianity and, and Islam, see themselves and always have seen themselves as having um, a global project. But what we're talking about today, I believe, is the question of religion under conditions of contemporary globalization. There are three aspects of this that uh, consistently strike me. I'll describe these three aspects very briefly under the broad heading of cultural intimacy, which I, uh, which I understand, uh, broadly speaking, as a facet of neoliberal governmentality. The first of these and, and this is a comment not about just about Islam and Christianity, but about uh, globalizing religion under contemporary conditions more, more broadly, is the, uh, a certain spiritual and cultural emphasis on modesty, sincerity, uh, love, uh, affection, and humanism one might say humanism on the small scale. So the new Pope, Pope Francis I's um, opening uh, words, which I, um, I guess the Guardian, which I was reading yesterday on the train, have translated out of Italian, are I think very characteristic in this regards when he says, the Pope must open his, arm, his arms to protect all of God's people and embrace with tender affection the whole of humanity, especially the poorest, the weakest, the smallest, those whom Matthew lists in the final judgment on love, the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, and those in prison. So it's that opening emphasis on embracing with tender affection the whole of humanity that strikes, to my mind, a very characteristically contemporary global note. So one, this emphasis on modesty, sincerity, love, affection, and what I'm describing as humanism on the small scale, a seeming oxymoron there. A second facet of this 
is the climate of religious offense given and taken. The demand for respect in a multicultural environment, which takes the form of an increasing climate um, of not just of religious offense, uh, but of blasphemy laws, which are very much on the rise um, in the Islamic world, in Western Europe, and in many other um, places. A third uh, facet of globalized religion and spirituality that uh, interests me um, and is related to this is the intensification um, of the control of gendered and sexualized uh, behavior, the intensifying struggle over women's um, bodies and women's reproductive uh, rights. So these th three things uh, are, are, are strike me looking very broadly um, at contemporary conditions of globalization um, and religion um, are um, strike me as being um, important. The emphasis on modesty, sincerity, love, affection, and humanism on the small scale is something that I would also, I think worth, it's worth observing at this point, would connect with uh, digital technologies um, and the, the sheer omnipresence uh, of voices um, and faces um, on screens, on mobile phones, um, and so forth. So coming to uh, my own particular area of I interest, uh, Islam, uh, from a globalization perspective, uh, it's worth pointing out, I think, before I, I come to my particular case study, some of the general uh, areas of discussion um, here, because I think this might usefully prefigure some of the things that are going to come up over the course of the day. Um, firstly, I would note the decline of traditional uh, legal um, and theological authorities, especially that of El Azhar in, in Cairo, and their replacement by more diffuse forms of political and legal authority outside of the Arab and Muslim majority world, and particularly in the diasporas. It's the books and the fatwas that are emanating from the UK from France, from Germany, from the United States that carry, and particularly from amongst scholars in the migrant communities there, um, that can carry every bit as much weight um, as the fatwas and the books um, and the opinions and the sermonizing coming out of Egypt uh, or of Istanbul um, or of Pakistan um, that, that are significant. Of course, the traditional legal authorities uh, such as uh, um, those associated with Al Azhar um, are engaged in a, a kind of a, a, a fight back, as it were, uh, uh, an attempt to kind of recenter themselves. Um, subject of interesting uh, work recently by Melika Zagal. A second related point is that global Islamist fashions, ranging from popular music to to religious dress uh, to uh, hijab. Uh, to styles and fashions in, 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 um, in popular culture more broadly, move as much to rhythms emanating from uh, Kreuzberg, um, from the Bonlieu in Paris, from Brick Lane in London, as much as they do um, from the streets of Cairo, Istanbul, Jakarta, and New Delhi. So once again, um, th this is an observation uh, about the, the broader global frame, one which uh, embraces migrant culture that we need to have in mind when we're thinking about the kind of more or less global rhythms of uh, Islamist fashion. A third observation here um, that's been much, uh, much discussed in the recent literature is to, your, to, to use George Udice's useful formulation, a culture of expediency as regards culture, a new concept of culture, one might say, on the part of Islamist leadership across the Muslim world, and particularly a culture of expediency in relation to popular culture, where, that is to say, 
it clearly is perceived to be doing good and where it is not perceived to be challenging authority. So the recent work uh, on um, attitudes towards popular culture uh, amongst the Hezbollah leadership in Lebanon being done by Joseph El Aga, for example, strikes me as being very interesting in this regard. Here you have uh, an authority uh, which at least to Western minds and Western ears is associated with a kind of censoriousness uh, regarding culture and popular culture in particular, is expressing a huge interest in the possibility um, of comedy, um, of popular music, of popular theater, and various other facets of popular culture um, for the, the sake of um, communicating the religious message. All of this goes under the broad category of in Arabic, al fan al-Muqawim, al-Mutazim, al-Hadith, which is to say uh, committed art, uh, revolutionary art, um, art, with, art with a purpose. Sociologist Asef Bayat has discussed this um, under the resonant title of the politics of fun in the Islamic world, um, which is a nice way, I think, of capturing this, a, a nice, nicely ironic way, I think, of capturing this uh, dynamic uh, of um, expedient attitudes towards culture on the part of previously censorious Islamist leadership in many parts of the Islamic world, whether Sunni or Shia. And finally, uh, also much discussed, uh, is an engagement on the part of cultural activists within Islamist movements all over the Muslim world with world music, with Western media markets and festivals and related value systems. There are, I think, two diametrically opposed uh, dynamics at play here, um, both of which have been subject to some interesting discussion. One is the kind of globalized uh, Sufi, sort of soft Sufi spirituality um, associated both with world music and with world music festivals, which has been nicely written about by authors such as Deborah Capchen, who's looking at the phenomenon here in France, uh, and Jonathan uh, Shannon. Who, whose, uh, whose studies may be known to you. So on the one hand, you've got this kind of uh, soft, uh, fuzzy, uh, kind of world music sensitized, uh, global Sufi spirituality. On the other hand, uh, and I think in some kind of dialectical relationship to it, uh, you have, um, but equally engaged uh, with Western uh, world music markets and, and, and attitudes and value systems um, is a, um, uh, a popular cultural art of uh, resistance which carries with it um, a great deal of Islamist and Islamic signification, uh, particularly through the medium of rap and hip hop. This is something that goes back to the late 1980s, fundamental in the UK, for example, are well known, and in France uh, here, uh, Nick Tamer, uh, for example, has also been subject of much uh, discussion. So it's in these broad uh, contexts and within this broad uh, literature that I want to now say a few uh, work, words about some of my ongoing research on the popular culture associated with the Turkish uh, Islamist movement. And I say them partly because Emmanuel asked me just to say a few <laughs> words about that, just to, as it were, put another case study um, on the table in what will no doubt be um, a, a rich uh, set of case studies that, that, will, follow the, um, that will follow this morning. Um, but also, I think, just to illustrate some of the um, more general points that I've just been making. So... I've been particularly interested in the relationship between the 
the rise of the Turkish Islamist movement in the 1990s. This was a, a process of, <coughs> excuse me, a political emergence which began first at the municipal level and then at the national level. Um, its causes have been the subject of, of much discussion. Um, a protest against the inefficiency and the corruption and the authoritarianism um, of the secularist regimes which govern, govern Turkey since the, um, since the establishment of the Republic. Um, a kind of feminist movement, some people argue. A movement which embraces the Kurdish hinterlands in some people's uh, view. Um, a democratic movement um, in, 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 in many people's view. Whatever the, the causes, whatever the root causes uh, of, of the, the rise to power of the Islamist uh, parties in Turkey in the 1990s, uh, this rise to power has been uh, spectacular. It's involved, as I've just said, not, not only the capture of the municipal apparatus and the national apparatus, but at the moment, through Recep Tayyip Erdogan, it's establishing a kind of regional hegemony as well of immense uh, significance. So this is a, a political movement of, of some real significance, and it's of significance outside of the region as well, because the quote-unquote Turkish model uh, is, is, is very often um, being um, uh, presented um, uh, by various people for various uh, reasons as, as it were, the acceptable face of political Islam. Less well known is the uh, cultural, are, less well known are the cultural dynamics of this movement and particularly its accommodating attitudes uh, towards music, towards film, uh, towards the mass media, towards television and towards popular music in particular. As far as music is concerned, uh, the, the words that were being thrown around in the late 1980s and the early 1990s to capture the new piety, the new religiosity in the popular cultural sphere were terms like yeshil pop or, or green pop or yeni ilahi, uh, sort of the new hymn singing uh, movement. Um, I'll show you a few uh, pictures so you have some visual uh, impact here. Um, these are uh, some photos taken some four or five years ago uh, of uh, Ramazan festivities. So um, quite apart from the mass media dimensions of this, there's been a, a new culture of, fest of is Islamic festivity in Turkish cities. Ramazan um, in the 1980s when I first started doing my research was, was certainly noted, but it was not a big uh, public event which made an impact on downtown city life but now it most certainly does. So here are some pictures from Ramazan a few years ago. Uh, this is a picture of a poet declaiming religious poetry to, I'm not sure how much you can see here, but a very large uh, crowd. Um, this is a picture of um, a concert um, put on by the local uh, Islamist municipality in a purpose-built uh, concert hall uh, which serves almost exclusively uh, um, uh, religious programming uh, needs. So musicians, choirs, um, a group of, of, uh, of uh, pious school children uh, declaiming uh, religious uh, uh, song. Uh, singers, such as the, the singer that will concern me briefly in a moment, Mehmet Emin I and uh, Mustafa Deirmenji. Listeners of a lower middle class, working class variety in these, as you can see, very fancy uh, purpose-built uh, auditoria, a very sort of disciplined scene of listening. Listening <laughs> via mobile phone, of course, because this is how one listens. And finally, <clears throat> the protagonist 
um, of my recent research. This is a man called Mehmet Emin I. He was born in 1963 in Van, in eastern Turkey. In his high school years, he moved with his parents to the city of uh, Bursa, which is a large industrial city in the west of Turkey, where he completed his, um, his high school education. He was academically successful. He went on to university. Uh, he did a PhD in theology, and he was appointed at a very young age to a professorship in theology at Bursa's Uludağ uh, University. <clears throat> so his is a an, his is an academic career. His 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 day job um, uh, has been as a career uh, academic. But he started off life as a Quran reciter. His father was a distinguished Quran reciter in the Istanbul style, in which style Mehmet Emin I continues to recite. So he recites for the National uh, Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, he makes recordings of Quran recitations uh, which circulate very widely indeed. Along the way, he invented, he created, more or less as a result of his own energies and, and interests um, and cultural entrepreneurship, a style of religious popular music, which caught on very quickly, particularly amongst lycée kids and particularly amongst young university um, students, um, particularly in the dorm system in the provincial Turkish universities. He made quite a name for himself then. And within a few years, I think it was in 1996, he formed a uh, taking advantage of all sorts of liberalizations of the media system in Turkey. He created uh, a recording company, Beza Yapım, specifically oriented to producing pious, to, to, to both producing and distributing uh, pious uh, music, popular music, both his own and that of other people. And he did this for about 10 years. During the course of these 10 years, in other words, from about 1996 to 2006, he released something like 20 of his own CDs, all of which have been themed um, around various, um, uh, take the form of uh, various different kinds of projects. <coughs> Many of them sung in Persian uh, and Arabic um, as well as in Turkish. Musically speaking, many of them oriented to the musical genres, particularly the mass-mediated genres of the entire uh, region. Musically speaking, many of them oriente oriented towards earlier kinds of spiritual poetry which had perhaps disappeared and perhaps he felt were in need of some kind of resuscitation. So you have not just an academic mind here, but you have a rather cosmopolitan uh, mind here. So these recordings um, uh, were quite numerous, um, circulated very widely um, indeed, um, increasingly um, on, the, uh, on, the, um, on the internet, um, and particularly over the last four years or so um, via mobile phone technology. When one looks at the figures that one can, one can gather, um, in various ways, there's, very, there's clearly a huge spike in the listenership or a huge spike in the circulation of this music, which coincides very neatly with the advent of, um, of mobile phone technology um, enabling uh, easy uh, downloads uh, of this music and of surfing the web. The other facet of this, of this, of, of this person that interests me um, has, has been interestingly, interestingly, interesting me more and more in recent years um, is um, the move to uh, Facebook, um, the development of an online uh, personality which brings together not just his musical activities, his, his activities as a singer and as a creator of this new kind of religious pop, but also his, um, his, his preaching. Now a very interesting 
uh, observation here um, is that a new genre of preaching seems to be emerging in response to the possibilities of the internet um, and of Facebook in, in particular. Increasingly not called vaz, which is the Arabic term for preaching, increasingly using the rather kind of intimate uh, expression, sohbet, a conversation. So Mehmet Emin I's Facebook page um, can, can, has him uploading um, all of his various uh, 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 conversations. Some of them delivered as sermons in mosques and some of them just delivered as kind of face-to-face -face, uh, conversations, as it were, uh, with listeners the other side of the computer screen. <clears throat> So I think the important point, I want to just uh, get over, I think, two important um, points here. Uh, one um, being that this character, Mehmet Emin I, is very typical of the kinds of classes and the kind of card cadres um, that have uh, accompanied uh, the rise to power of the Islamist movement in Turkey. Uh, under the dominance of the AK party and closely connected, connected to two uh, prominent, let me just call them Sufi groups, the, the risale i nur community and the Gülen movement. Okay, I could say a little bit more about that, but, but this uh, connection of these, of these particular uh, spiritual groups, religious groups, and the AK party um, has really powered uh, Islamist resurgence in Turkey. And Mehmet Amin I is very typical of the kind of person, sort of upwardly mobile, uh, media savvy, uh, cosmopolitan, entrepreneurial, um, who is very much uh, um, uh, very much part of this uh, movement. So that's one point that I want to make uh, at this juncture. And the other is to stress the, uh, the intimate connection of this movement with the new uh, communication technologies. Uh, and with it, a style of address which is not only honed and shaped in terms of these new uh, communication uh, technologies, but also engages, as it were, the intimacy uh, of these uh, spaces. So the music and the sermons and uh, almost everything going on here is created and is conceived in terms of what you can do in a, in a recording studio or for, with now increasingly with the kinds of recording facilities that you have on a laptop computer, speaking to and communicating to individuated listeners, either listening on mobile phones or listening on their laptops themselves. So I think it's important to, to establish that the cultural forms here that the communicational processes here um, are very much those of the uh, contemporary communicational environment and are really very different to and separate from um, the styles of preaching and from the styles of music making um, associated with uh, religious and spiritual engagement 20 or 30 years ago in Turkey. How then do we look at and think about uh, this uh, kind of music? Well, unfortunately, I can't get a, a live um, link um, because it, it might have been nice to have gone into this Facebook page and, and to have, uh, have clicked on a few things and show you some of the things that are going on here. But hopefully some kind of verbal uh, uh, some kind of verbal description uh, will suffice. So, uh, first of all, Mehmet Amin I's Facebook page is, uh, is linked to and feeds into and feeds uh, out of the, the uh, Facebook page uh, associated with the, uh, the mosque that he works uh, at, that he's connected with as a preacher, the Edebali Mosque in uh, Bursa. Um, so these two sites uh, feed uh, uh, into one another. 
the Facebook page um, consists uh, of him, uh, of his various messages to his, uh, his followers of a rather short and brief kind, wishing people um, holiday greetings and so on and so forth. They also consist, as I've said, of uploads of television appearances, of addresses of one kind or another, um, and of YouTube um, uh, uh, videos uh, which are actually being produced by the Edebali uh, Mosque. They also comprise, as um, the picture on the screen um, indicates, uh, various embeddings uh, of recordings. Now what's quite interesting is that uh, Mehmet Amin I now lives a very busy life. He's a, a busy academic. Um, he has a busy round of, of work associated with his Quran recitation um, and with his preaching duties. And uh, about a year ago, he was appointed to the, the Muftuluk of Bursa, which is, to say, which is a, a very uh, significant uh, administrative position, which makes him responsible for uh, state religious policy in the province of Bursa. So we're talking about a very busy guy, a very busy guy uh, indeed. So his, the work that he used to do um, in both recording and making and circulating this popular music is now very much in the past. Nonetheless, at regular intervals, he will upload uh, a, uh, a song from, from one of his uh, albums, just as it were, to, to keep his Facebook page uh, kind of diverse, interesting, um, and, as it were, multimedia. So there's something kind of retrospective uh, about these uh, Facebook uh, postings of old music videos. What do the music videos consist of? Usually, there's nothing very much to see. Uh, visually speaking, uh, there is a kind of predictable uh, dullness that will be familiar to many of you who do research in the Muslim world where there are no representations of singers, no representations of musicians, no representations of musical uh, instruments. Instead, one has pictures of flowers, uh, waterfalls, uh, beautiful mosques, uh, beautiful green lawns, um, in <coughs> insects, um, beautiful things of, of one kind or another. You click on the, on the, um, on, on the music and the, the, the visuals uh, are, are, are there uh, primarily to establish a kind of appropriately pious visual environment um, for the music. Now, in some cases, the uh, responses to these Facebook and YouTube postings are really quite extensive. So one song that I've been looking at, uh, a song called Bu Geje Sendin Gelen, um, which goes right back to 2006, has been listened to well over a million times. I mean, close to one and a half million hits on this particular song. So there's an extraordinary amount of activity, it seems to me, on, on, on these sites. And has attached to it some 900, close to 1,000 uh, comments. So there's a very kind of lively culture of, 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 of responding in the little box that one has available to respond to you, as well as liking and unliking on the Facebook page, um, to, 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 to make some kind of a comment, to get some kind of a conversation going about the music, or just simply to establish one's presence. So there are three uh, themes that, that, um, that come up uh, in these commentaries. They make very interesting reading for an ethnomusicologist. One of the things that I, I, I'm just uh, beginning to develop a sensitivity to, by the way, is the, um, is the fact that one's looking back now um, over the course of six or seven years with a, with a particular song. Um, so one has, in a very particular kind of a way, in ways that, of course, can be, can be misleading and problematic, as well as, 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 well as illuminating and revealing. Uh, one has um, a kind of historical uh, strand of commentary about a particular song, which is really s certain aspects of that historicity are, are beginning to interest me more and more. But for the moment, I'll just leave that, I'll leave that uh, topic aside. So the three uh, particular themes that leap out of this material, um, one being the 
establishment of the fashioning, shall I say, of community. The question of community, the, que the question of a non-face-to-face uh, co uh, community, the question of, of the Facebook community uh, is uh, a rich one. And what one sees in these commentaries, in the process of listening to a particular song, um, is, is some collective fashioning of community, often in terms, expressed in terms of, of, of people writing in and saying where they're listening from, describing a scene of listening. So, my name is Emin, I'm from Bosnia, I love this song. Or, I remember we used to listen to this song um, in, um, back when we were in Iraq. We used to listen to this in, uh, in, during Ramazan evenings. Um, hi, I'm listening from Berlin, or I'm listening from Kreuzberg, or I'm listening from somewhere in Germany. Um, or uh, th this is, th this is uh, Sinan, or this is Mehmet, and, and I'm writing in from Turkmenistan. Greetings all. So these kind of statements, which are, are as it were, uh, prompted by the song, but which are addressing the electronic community out there and locating the listener in a particular place and in a particular time and simply extending greetings to everybody else who might be listening seems to be one of the important uh, tasks that this process of commentary is doing, is, is fashioning a kind of a community. It almost goes without saying, but, but it's worth underlining that this is most definitely not just a Turkish community. It's a community of Turkish speakers, very often, um, or Turkish German speakers, um, but they are writing in um, from many, many different parts of the Muslim world. Secondly, there is a, uh, an ongoing uh, debate about legitimacy. Um, the old questions um, about whether this kind of music is okay, whether this kind of music is acceptable, whether it's all right to have music with a spiritual uh, message but which comes out of recording studios and involves musical instruments. Have we got five minutes? Are we okay? Yeah. Um, uh, um, th there's uh, a canonical discussion which goes back to the Hadithic, um, not the Quranic, but the Hadithic uh, literature, um, which questions uh, the legitimacy uh, of musical forms of expression and particularly the presence of musical instruments. These comments come up fairly repeatedly and take some interesting kinds of forms. So the debates and the discussions about what is this music um, are really kind of quite prominent. They are, they are not only debates and discussions about legitimacy, they're discussions about more uh, kind of general questions of uh, reception. So, for example, one very interesting and rather vituperative um, exchange involves somebody who said, who just types in saying, I hate this song. This is a terrible song. And somebody types back and says, and says, why? What's the problem? Well, I associate it with the religious boarding school that I used to go to and there was some idiot next door who used to put this, sing, this song on very, very early in the morning and it used to wake me up and it used to make me really mad and really angry. And then there was a long discussion really about the appropriateness of this response and whether it was appropriate to get uh, angry and upset, um, and whether it was appropriate to express oneself in these terms and so on and so forth. Um, yet another uh, little debate which I found fascinating was a person writing in and saying, I'm an atheist. So somebody was writing in in Turkish, Turkish and saying, I'm an atheist, but somehow this music speaks to me. The, 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 what, what beautiful music. D don't know what's going on here, um, but, you know, good stuff. So uh, there's a, a very quick response um, in, in which somebody replies, well, you say that you're an atheist, but if, you, if, you were, if you're responding to this music as a, as a thing of beauty, if you're responding to this person's voice as a thing of beauty, then God, you have to recognize that God is speaking to you in some way or another, and it seems to me you can't really call yourself an atheist. The atheist then writes back and says, no, 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 I absolutely insist on this. I am an atheist. Um, and the, the, discussion, the discussion goes on, and um, eventually uh, uh, the, the moderator of the Facebook site steps in. I don't quite know how this works, but various things have been blanked out there. So evidently, the discussion gets kind of quite, quite heated. So debates and discussions, which the way I would describe this is the, the, uh, the construction of a, of, of, of a space of ethical values, shall we say, uh, around this 
around this music. Um, something which is not given, as it were, in this music or in this community, but something which is, is being built up and which, has, which is in process, as it were, um, and has been in process over the last uh, six years and is being somehow transacted um, in these terms. The third thing that interests me about these, um, about these YouTube and Facebook uh, uh, discussion sites is, is the, the fashioning um, of a s space of aesthetic values, which is to say, obviously connected to the ethics of this music, which I've just been talking about, but, but how and in what way this music is beautiful. Right? And I think, just as a general observation um, about today, I, I, I mean, I think, um, as I was saying at the beginning, it's important to keep these questions um, of beauty and, 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 and uh, connected as they are to creativity very much um, at the heart of our discussions here because they, they do something. They, 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 they mobilize. They, they make things happen. They engender discussion. They engender community. Uh, they motivate, in other, in other words. And too often, with our social scientific habits of thought, we, we explain these things away. We reduce them to other things that we're, we find more easy and more comfortable uh, to talk about. But here, on this site, one has a quite, I think, protracted uh, situation of fashioning aesthetic values in terms of an aesthetics of sevgi, of love, of gunul, of soulfulness, uh, which means tears. So it's very interesting in this music just how many people are writing in and finding one way or another of expressing a state of tearfulness. I listened, you know, from the very simple, I listened to this and I cried to much more complicated things. Um, like I keep on listening to this music and, and every time I listen to this song it makes me cry. Why is it that this song makes me cry in particular but, but the other ones don't? So some, some quite sort of interesting and complicated uh, language um, that is being deployed here to describe these kind of purifying, spiritually purifying states of tearfulness. Also an aesthetic of temizdik, of, of, of sincerity, uh, an aesthetic of zikr, which is a more traditional uh, Islamic aesthetic notion here, one uh, concerning uh, remembrance, a sort of painful kind of remembrance. And then a rather more diffuse set of conversations just about the, the, the quality of güzellik in Turkish, just beauty. Um, what is the beauty here? What is beautiful? Um, how does one talk about the beauty of the voice, the ses? How does one talk about the beauty of, of the composition, of the ezgi, or of the, of the melody? How does one talk about the beauty of the, of the poem, or the shi'ir? So one's talking then um, uh, about a, a space of Facebook-mediated electronic uh, communication in which, uh, at play, it seems to me, is a fashioning of community, a fashioning of an ethical sphere, and a fashioning of an aesthetic sphere. And I think what one wants to do um, given this, um, is to find ways of conceptualizing uh, the relationships and of thinking about the relationships, because I think these relationships are very powerful and very present uh, between the fashioning of community um, and ethics um, and aesthetics in this new Islamist space. So to conclude, uh, I think I had about 40 minutes, and I think I'm just coming up to the end of my 40 minutes, so I'll, I'll wrap things up here and attempt to respond to questions, if you have any. Um, I've been talking about a, a local case. I've been talking about a local case study. Or rather, I've been talking about uh, a case study that has many local uh, dimensions, which some of you in this room may be somewhat familiar with. Many of you, I suspect, won't be familiar with uh, at all. But I do want to stress in concluding the uh, usefulness of thinking of this and of locating this uh, material in the broader uh, discussion of the globalization of Islam and global religion uh, more broadly speaking. Firstly, though it's a local case study, 
the Turkish material here, I think, speaks very strongly outside of its region. Uh, Turkish popular culture, Turkish media now circulates very broadly across the Balkans uh, and across Central Asia and indeed across much of the northern Arab world uh, as well. High production values coming from a wealthy and rather buoyant country at the moment. This kind of music and this kind of popular culture is, uh, is influential, I would have said, uh, regionally um, in ways that bear consideration. It circulates uh, regionally uh, and has an effect regionally in ways which um, bear thinking about. And finally, uh, I would observe that, 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 that the broader themes that have interested me here, these, um, these uh, expedient attitudes towards culture um, on the part of the political authorities, um, this uh, culture of uh, what I'm calling face, what I'm describing as Facebook piety here, um, this um, the connection of this uh, with a, a style of spirituality which focuses very much on modesty, sincerity, love, affection, and what I was calling at the outset humanism on the small scale. These seem to me to be things that one would need to understand and situate uh, in terms of a broader uh, discussion of the globalization of religion. On that note, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you.